a son who enters income tax return information into a computer program and prints the return. They're not considered to be a preparer. A woman who prepares income tax returns in her home during filing season and accepts payments for her services. She would be considered a preparer for the purposes of the penalty. And volunteers at a local church who prepare income tax returns but accept no payments, not considered to be preparers. So that those core definitions are still true. Now, if you're a preparer, you also have some other, besides drawing into it. Now, all right, we're, we're trying to look at what is a return, who is the preparer, can you be pulled into this preparer issue. You also have different types of preparer requirements. One is that you have to manually sign each return. And today, if you've been filing electronically, you know that there is no such thing as a manual signature anymore, but you enter your PIN number, and that's satisfying as an obligation. So you have to do that. And most software today forces you to do that. So I, I think this is becoming less and less available. Um, if you're not available to file the return, in other words, sign it, um, you have to at least, if you review that return, you're held responsible for that. But the person who actually signs it, for example, if let's say I can't file a return and I need somebody else to sign it for me, but not sign my name, but rather sign it for me, they would have to come in and review the information that I've already reviewed and then accept responsibility for it. So you just can't say, well, Arthur Reed did it, I'll sign my name, but it's under him. By signing it, you're effectively saying you're the return preparer. Um, you have to take primary responsibility for that return. Um, in the old days, and there are still people who, I saw a chart the other day, there are still people that manually, these are paid preparers that manually file returns um, and they, they sign. And in those days, a lot of places were trying to get a photocopy of stamps that just stamps returns are done. It has to be manually signed, not, not that electronic, uh, not that, that stamp thing anymore. Uh, but there are still people that manually prepare and file tax returns. Um, you must maintain a record or a list of all the tax returns that you prepare. Um, what I do is a, just as a matter of course, you know, you have your, most software provides you a list with everything that you can actually print out. Um, but I keep a printed copy, and I know a number of people just keep PDF files on hand rather than, than printing all the time. And uh, you just you don't have to keep a copy of it. You just have to keep a list of the returns that you prepare. You have to have identification numbers on each one of them. So you have a specific taxpayer identification number. And you have to have the address of the preparer. Now, I don't like to add new things into, in other words, 2011 issues into a 2010 review. But if you are currently in the area of preparation, one of the things that you realize that in order to be an income tax preparer, you needed to create this year, if you hadn't done it already, a what's called a P10 number. And the new regulations require all paid return preparers, including attorneys, CPAs, and enrolled agents, to apply for a preparer tax identification number, even if you already had one before preparing any tax returns in the 2011 year for 2010. So it's one of those straddle, like do I talk about it or do I not do this? Now, before tax season, I went online, I went through the process of applying for my P10 number. It took all of about five minutes to do, and I think I had my acceptance notice within 24 hours. And the one issue that they were concerned with was making sure they got a check or debit card for $64.25. And so that is something new that they're doing. Part of this is a process where eventually all return preparers will be licensed. And as being a licensed return preparer, uh, one of the things that you'll be um, subject to um, is, is continuing professional education, having to pass, test, pass a basic test, et cetera. So for those, for, for you folks who are taking the EA course and you'll be an enrolled agent, this will not apply to you. You won't have to be licensed because you'll already be licensed. Also, in the 2010 year, that'll take place in the 2011 year, um, the IRS sent out more than 10,000 letters to tax return preparers nationwide to remind them of their obligation to prepare accurate tax returns on behalf of their clients. The letters were sent to a pool of paid preparers who complete large volumes of tax returns with schedules A's, C's, and E's. 
The selection of the preparers receive the letters based upon um, those firms to identify preparers that they may need assistance in meeting their required responsibilities. During uh, the letter includes enclosures that remind the tax return preparers of their responsibilities and consequences of filing incorrect returns. During the 2001 2011 filing season, the IRS representatives will visit, like they're going to show up during tax season, just what we want. Um, 2,500 return preparers who receive these letters to further discuss responsibilities as a return preparer and verify, i.e. audit, uh, the compliance with existing return preparer requirements. So that's what they're doing in this 2011 tax year. Um, the e-file requirements, which is, which is then kicking off of this, which is another section, is that by for the 2011 year, um, they're going to start phasing in that anyone files 100 returns or more will be required to e-file if you're not already there. Now, there's also a great frequently asked questions sections on the return preparers. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of these except there was one or two pieces of information that I thought were relevant to the things that I just covered. Um, it says, will the IRS revenues assess return preparers during these visits? Okay, so are they going to re assess return preparer penalties during these visits? And the answer is yes. The IRS will request that you have available all tax forms that you have, that you have prepared in the 2010 year, including all relevant documents. Relevant documents include, but are not limited to, worksheets. Uh, interview notes, correspondence, and copy of returns that you prepared for, re, um, for your return. No additional advanced preparation is required, but the IRS will provide um, educational materials to know what your obligations are. Um, they will also go through and say the, the things they're looking for is that did you provide your client with a copy of the return? Is it a signed return as required by the regulations? Did you furnish their identification numbers? Um, as required by the regulations, you retain a copy or a list of the returns that you prepared, um, that you filed corrected information re correct information returns, and properly refused to endorse and negotiate a refund check that was issued to the taxpayer. If regulations, if violations are found, the revenue agent, revenue agent may determine that it is appropriate to assess. Uh, penalties. And it goes on and on to talk about what are some of the obligations about making a reasonable inquiry about do we have to audit our client's records. Um, largely some of the components that I've already talked through that notice as well. So these things are coming out and they're coming out quite, quite frequently. Um, I'll talk more about the penalties in just a second. Uh, but let's take a minute and look at a question. I'd like you to go right now um, we just said questions one, two, and three. Um, let's take a look at questions number, uh, at this point, question number seven. In question seven, an enrolled agent can recommend a position on a client's tax return as long as the position is reasonable, not frivolous, and adequately disclosed. Those are sort of the key phrases that we look for, so the answer to that one would be D. Let's try two others. Let's look at questions number eight and nine. In eight, Sanders and an EA prepared Linda's income tax return. She sold some stock, believes that the proceeds are all a return of capital and therefore should not be included in gross income. After research, Sandra determines that there's reasonable basis for Linda's position, but she does not believe that there is a realistic possibility of success on her merits. In other words, well, it's okay, but I'm not really convinced. Uh, under the circumstances, can, Linda si sorry, can Sandra sign Linda's return if the proceeds are not included in income reported on the return? And the answer is, for that level of threshold that she's not really comfortable with, the answer is A, if the, return, if the position is not frivolous and it is adequately disclosed on the return, then she can sign the return. Okay? All the other ones are, are great, you know, it's like, Linda documents or disagreement with Linda and keeps it in her file. I mean, that sounds like a good idea that you should do anyhow, but that doesn't relieve you of the position of disclosing it because it didn't really meet that threshold where you don't have to disclose it. Question number nine, Willie's the owner of an accounting firm. One of his employees prepares an income tax return for a client. 
and says that the deduction can be claimed as a bad debt. If the return is examined and the deduction is disallowed, Willie will not be subject to the return preparer under which of the following. Now, Willie's the owner of the CPA firm. So therefore, he is considered to be the person that the penalty will be assessed upon. The position on the return had a realistic um, possibility of being sustained on its merits. That's good. The position on the return had at least a one in three chance of being sustained on its merits. There is substantial authority to sustain the position. Those are the thresholds that we're looking at in order not to basically stay away from it. They've added into this, because this is an older question, the more likely than not standard, which is more than 50%. I would have liked to see that one added to that as well. There's a couple more in here that you can work. We're not going to go through those right now. But I want to go back to some of the more substantive penalties that you can have substantive in terms of being, now that we know that who's the return preparer, we know that if we have certain disclosure that might keep us away, we know that we're supposed to do something with our clients. So what are some of these penalties that we're dealing with? Well, if you're preparing someone's return, you have a requirement to give a copy at the time you file the return to that taxpayer. Um, this is an important aspect, so they, they know what went in, and they have a copy of that. I can't tell you the number of people that I've met before that say, you know, my preparer re filed my return. I've, I haven't even got a copy from last year yet. It's like, well, they're required to do that. Um, it's supposed to be the, no later than, than delivery, so um, you've got to get this, this information to them right away. Um, as far as returning copies or maintaining a list, you're required as the professional to keep a list for at least three years and the period that you start counting at is July 1st. So that's when the clock starts running. So it's not like on April 16th you shred the stuff from three years ago. Um, but those are your requirements as far as your maintaining either a list of the returns that you prepared or copies of the returns that you prepared. The compliance aspect of it as far as the penalties go are as follows. If you fail, for example, to do something typically the penalty is $50 per failure. If you're really bad and do a lot of failures in a year, there is a maximum penalty of $25,000. So I guess that's some good news if you do a lot of them. What are those penalties for? You know, if you fail to sign a return. In other words, you're deemed to be the preparer. You didn't sign it because you said, I'm not going to sign this thing. So you failed to do it. That's different than, like, how did I forget to sign it? And again, with electronic filing, this may not be an issue anymore. Affixing your ID number to the tax return, you could be penalized $50 per failure. Providing a copy to your taxpayer, $50 per failure. Uh, filing a correct return, just that part alone could be a minimum penalty of $50. And then failing to retain your list of copies of the return, that's also $50. So there's a lot of $50 things that you can get zinged for. Now, I'm going to add to that some more egregious penalties. Okay. The responsibilities of a tax, uh, tax return preparer, and these again, when you start walking through um, the, the, the core component of the law, and this is for the 2011 season, tax return preparers are required to exercise due diligence in preparing and assisting in the preparation of returns and claim for refunds. As a general rule of thumb, that means that the underlying substantive law affecting an item of deduction or income um, is, is what's included. Additional responsibilities include preparers with primary responsibility for the overall substantive accuracy of the preparation of return or claim for refund must sign the return or claim for refund. So you have to sign the return. Preparers who sign the return or claim for refund must include their identification number, which is now a P10, uh, for the returns or claims for refunds after December 31st, 2010. Preparers who sign the return or claim for a refund must provide a copy of each return or claim to the actual client. Preparers who sign the return or claim for a refund must retain a completed copy of the return or alternatively retain a, a record by list, card file electronically or otherwise of all taxpayers, their ID numbers, the taxable years, and the type of returns that were prepared. Preparers must make such copy or list available for inspection upon request by the IRS for a three-year period following the close of the return period. The return period is as of July 1st. 